If you're a real estate investor or you want to be a real estate investor, don't go anywhere because I'm getting ready to plug you into the money. Regardless of your credit, your experience, your verification of income, welcome to the show. If this is your first time to join in on Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor, I've got a special welcome for you. My lands, you are yes now part of the movement. We're getting like 30,000 downloads and listens a month now. And uh, wow, we're just exploding. So I'm glad you're here at the show. Here on the show, we talk about all things real estate investing, single family houses, commercial deals. And if this is your first time, just so you know, I'm known as Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, where I get you plugged into funding. And we have amazing guests here on the show as well. And today is no exception to that. In just a moment, I'm going to be introducing you to my friend, my fellow mastermind member, and the individual that can fund your deals as well. So not only do I have a free gift for everybody right here at the beginning of the show, but I also have a brand new guest for you to meet that can also help you with and get you funding for your deals. But uh, before I do that, I want to invite everybody, if you're tuned into iTunes or Google Play, be sure and subscribe. And uh, rate and review. Just recently, we hit new and noteworthy on iTunes. So that's pretty exciting. I'd love to get your feedback. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure and comment right below. Get your comments uh, down there and also enter your questions. We'll get your questions answered regarding uh, real estate investing. As I promised just a moment ago, I got a free gift for everybody that's tuning in. And that is, I've got a free online class for you to simply register for to attend. It's uh, ready for you. I just recently recorded it. And the name of the webinar is Where to Get the Money Now. It will explain to you the five easy steps from going from zero funding to getting over $2 million in funding, just like I did in less than 90 days when I started out. It's called Where to Get the Money Now. And here's where you can go check it out at the end of this show. Go right on over to www.jayconner.com forward slash money podcast. That's J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash money podcast. Well, as I promised just a moment ago, folks, my good friend, fellow mastermind member, I want to introduce to you all this guy is like no other guy that I know. He's got quite the story. His name is Jim Huntziger. And let me tell you about Jim. Uh, he's been in the real estate investing business since 2005. He's a licensed real estate broker, but check this out, folks. He's done over 500 deals. And up until the recent times, he has rehabbed like 95% of those deals. His average rehab budget is like $80,000. His largest rehab renovation budget that he's done is $410,000. And Jim is pretty well known. You may have heard of uh, Jim as being the creator of MLS domination. But Jim's got some new stuff going on in recent times here. And that's why I've got him here on the show. Jim has got funding for your multifamily deals. So here's the deal. Stay to the end of the show. We're not going to go too long today. And Jim is actually going to be giving out his personal contact information. You got a commercial deal, a multifamily deal. All you simply do is just email him, give him an overview on the deal, and he's going to talk to you about possibly partnering on your deal. So you're interested in commercial, multifamily, stay on the show because you're going to get plugged in. So with that, Jim, my good friend, welcome to the show, my man. Hey, Jay, and thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm glad to have you, Jim. And I know you're a busy guy, so I appreciate you taking the time to come here on the show with me. So let me just start out this way, Jim. I, you know, I don't know anybody more qualified to talk about themselves than yourself. <laughs> How is it you're qualified to be here on the show today, Jim, to talk about what we're going to talk about? 
Well, it's, it's interesting that I'm here on your show because I have lots of money to spend on multifamily and I just don't have enough multifamily deals to spend it on. So I figured this would be a great place to come to meet people to spend my multifamily money because there's lots of money in the marketplace that wants to spend it on multifamily. And I'm just trying to help them do that. That's all. <laughs> well, you know, that sounds like a good problem. You got more money than you know what to do with. And so you're looking for people that I have can find deals or they're looking at deals for you to do business with them, right? Yeah, right. Because stay in the deals, right? Because I can't, I can't be everywhere at all times. And there's, there's so many good pockets for multifamily all over the country. And even pockets, you know, some investors don't know about yet because they're just small towns or small areas. And so there's deals everywhere. And, and so, you know, we're, we're finding, you know, a lot of the deals that come to on my plate, you know, aren't really deals, frankly. And so people don't know if they have deals or if they, but, but at the same time, you now something we'll talk about today is, is a seven figure profit I had on a, on a wholesale that we sold for 2.3 million. And that was somebody that wasn't really sure what they have, you know? And so that's kind of how I decided to come out and do some interviews on the podcast to get the word out that I, you know, I got a lot of money behind me to spend on multifamily. And if you have a deal or you think you have a deal, uh, you know, email it to me and we'll give you my contact information at the end. But, you know, the deal that we bought that was, uh, it was in Oklahoma city was, we bought it for a million two fifty, and the seller thought that because the tax assist value was a million two, he thought he took us for like 50 grants. So I, you know, told the title company how happy he was that he got, you know, the million two fifty. So he was ecstatic. Now we sold it that for 2.3 million or the total profit of a million 60. And uh, that was a deal that the, that the people brought it to me. I met them at a mastermind. Somebody came in, just sat at my table at lunch. Just one of those, you know, things told me about the deal. I'm like, that sounds pretty good. Let me see the, you know, let me look at the actual numbers. Let me see the financials on that. Okay. And that was a real deal. Got, got into it. And, you know, we sold it. Uh, we had to sell it three times. Though. That, that's the only hard part. That's what I, I mean. I, you know, I want to, I'm out here to meet people. But also when I was new, I started studying this still like four years ago is when I started studying multifamily long before I jumped into it because there's so many different facets of it, you know. And so this deal, let me tell you, though, watch, we had we had a buyer, cash buyer. It was for only for it was for two point. I think it was two point four is what that was. And they on the it was supposed to hold on a Friday. The Monday of, of that, that week, they called and said, we need a financing extension for 30 days for our cash deal, which, of course, we were a little surprised by because it was a cash deal. Uh, we said, you know, OK, for an additional $40,000, we'll give you 30 days. They said, no, no, we're not giving you any more money. And we said, wait, wait, but it doesn't really work that way. If you want an extension, we're going to give you an extension. But otherwise, we have to keep your money because you're defaulting. Well, they turned out to be attorneys. And they sent threatening letters to the title company who wouldn't release the money to us, even though it was clearly hard in the contract and they didn't perform. Uh, but they made them think that we didn't give them stuff prior to. Now, prior to the, the date of the earnest money going hard, they said, well, they didn't give us all the information. Well, that's not how it works. Uh, they have, they, they, if they don't get all the information by the date, they have to cancel, right? And they didn't. So the money goes hard, except their attorneys and scared the title company. So uh, either way, we ended up having to give them the money back because we wouldn't sign to release it. However, they also put a lien on our property, started a foreclosure process. <laughs> but since they backed out, we had found another buyer, which this buyer was a syndicate. And syndications aren't for me. I know there's a place for them and people do really well with them. But I I buy the deal. It's, it's me and my partner. We come in, we, we bring in, I'm bringing sponsors sometimes to put the down payment, but we don't do big, like having multiple people in the deals. It's the lender, maybe a sponsor and that's it. And that, that's how I do all, all the deals. But the second deal, uh, that, that buyer, so we sold to the third buyer. The, the second buyer lost 200 grand in hard earnest money that they could never get back. They, we actually gave them an extra three months at the end. This, this, this was a three month, by the way, this was a three month flip as a wholesale that we bought. We plan on owning it for three months. I ended up owning it for 19 months. We still made a million 60 on it. So everything went okay. But the second, that only because we cut 200 from the second buyer, because we were entitled to it. We gave them an extra three months to see if they could come up with the money. They couldn't do it. And we sold it to the third buyer and that closed and it just closed beginning of 2019. Here we are in March. So a couple months ago. So here's the question, Jim. What are the lessons learned from that experience that could help someone that's never done a commercial deal or could help somebody that's already doing uh, commercial deals? Strongly and strong. That's what we did on the third buyer is we strongly vetted the buyer, the financing, and just really looked at the, the person that, that, you know, they're because the, the lenders in this world, this, this asset, mind, mind you, was 40% occupied. It was a slumlord that never put any money into it. It was a really, really distressed asset. It's very difficult to get lending on. And then when you throw in Oklahoma that has lots of weather issues, for, so insurance is already high there, even if the asset's in good condition, it, 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 it has a lot of issues that you just wouldn't even know about. And so 
it was hard to get to get financing, which is why the first deal we took that was cash was very appealing. The second one we took, the guy we researched that guy probably not enough, but we still ended up, you know, we we kept two hundred on that, so we didn't lose during that time because the asset was not producing income; it was you know negative monthly. And then the third buyer, we just vetted very strongly. We looked into his history, what he's done, how many how many units he's owned, where the money was coming from, what kind of because it was a lender. It ended up being it was not a cash deal; it was a bridge loan. And but we looked at that lender that they've, they've done a lot of business with before. So we did a lot of we did a lot of research. We had three buyers in the end. And one buyer was a big, big apartment buyer, like, you know, somebody that's pretty well known in, in the space, but this was a, a 91 unit deal. And I, I don't think it was quite big enough. I don't think we had his attention to be perfectly honest. It's a guy that I know. He's a great guy. He's very nice, but I just don't think this was a big enough deal. And so we pulled it out from under him saying, Hey, I'm, you know what? We're going to go to somebody who we have their attention. So another thing that, you know, like, here's a, like, I would have loved to have sold to this guy because he's a big person in the, in the, in the, in the apartment world, but I didn't have his attention. I could tell I didn't have his attention. And we were on the third buyer here. We didn't have time to not have somebody's attention. So you really got to make sure you understand your buyer, what your goal is and what you're trying to do. Because, you know, if I sold, if, if we picked him as the buyer and he couldn't believe we didn't, I don't know if this ends up closing. It might, it probably would have, but he closed on like a 220 unit right after he put ours under contract. And that's, that's when I realized, or he was about to put ours under contract. And that's when I realized like this probably isn't big enough to have his full attention. The other guy, this was right up his alley. And that's how I decided on that buyer. We had two extremely qualified buyers. The third one was probably fine, but I had two that were really good. And one that I really wanted to sell it to, like, I, I can't believe I didn't, to be perfectly honest, but I could tell I wasn't get, I didn't get a phone call back for one full day one time. And this is a big deal. We're talking 2.4 million. And he was actually offering more money than the, than the buyer that I, I sold it to. So it was a hundred thousand more dollars, but the money I didn't, I already had money, fake money on the table before and deals didn't close. So that didn't matter to me. So I was looking for the real buyer that this was a deal they wanted, that they could, they were willing to close on. It wasn't something they would close on if they had time because they want to buy 200 unit stuff. I had to find the right buyers to point the story. So let's go back up to 30,000 feet. Hmm. For years and years, you were, you know, in the single family world, you were a rehabber. And then four years ago or so, you really started diving into this multifamily thing. So what are the advantages? In other words, what got you turned off to the single family world? And what are the advantages in the world of multifamily versus single family? And why are you focusing on that now? Well, as you can tell, Jay, I... I do things fast, right? I talk fast. It's just how I'm wired. I don't, you know, people say, how do you do that? Can I get some of that energy? I'm like, I wish I could transfer some because I could use to get some of it out of me sometimes, you know, but this is just how I'm wired. And so I, I started, you know, getting, getting rentals, you know, just like I, I learned single family one at a time. I bought a duplex. I bought a, you know, a two flat. I bought a four unit building. It was taking forever though. Like just, it was just, one by, and I'm like, there's got to be a better way. And I knew apartments and I liked the idea of apartments. So I, you know, I started, you know, I bought, you know, a handful, 14 rentals or something. I'm like, you know what? This is just taking forever. Like I'm going to table this whole idea. Let me start investigating this apartment complex thing. And so it took me a while because I was flipping. So I was making good money, you know, flipping the house, not, you know, keeping some, but mostly just turning and burning them. And so I was doing good. But then, you know, four years ago, I'm like, I got to just figure this out. So I, I, set a task to, okay, I'm going to research and learn multifamily. And so I've taken courses. I've talked, you know, talking to high level people at masterminds. I know that knew a lot about it and just networking. And I learned, you know, and, and you know, consciously paying attention to deals and what structures are, what makes a deal? What, what's a, what's a cap rate? Why is it, it's an 8% and this is a 10%. And what does all that mean? And so I, I wouldn't, I didn't want to go into these deals until I understood that because, I, you know, if you're going to get in, you got to understand the exit. Buying it right is everything. And it doesn't change from single family to, to multifamily. Buying it right doesn't change. So I had to understand what buying it right meant. And so I really had to understand the exit, the end game, so that I, like we kind of were talking, you know, you got to reverse engineer it. And so that's what I did. And then that's, I, you know, once I knew enough, which is about two years ago, a little over two years ago, I jumped in. And so I, I got my first complex and I got uh, multiple. What do you like about multifamily versus single family? You're buying a hundred at once. You know, I, I like think, buying things in bulk. I like, just, you know, the, the one-off stuff, it just was. It, so you're doing much bigger deals. Yes. And so instead of, so what was your average profit when you were doing single family houses? Oh, uh, we were, too, you know, I live, I'm in suburban Chicago. And so, you know, my price point, I'd buy them around two, two and a quarter. I'd sell them anywhere from, you know, 350 to 600, depending on the house. And so, you know, we were, we were making in the end, we were making anywhere from, you know, about 12% 
the the retail value is what we'd make, which was not really we prior to that we're making about twenty, you know, and uh, the the margin just gone down and down and down as time went on. That's why I hung that up last year. I, I don't rehab single family houses anymore at all. It just for me, for my market where I did it, it what didn't make sense anymore right now. People were you know paying more than I'd like. The contractors are so busy, like they just like they don't even know what to do with themselves. So they'll give you a price if you get a bid from them, which sometimes takes a couple of weeks to get the bid because they know if you say yes. Then they got to start working, and they, if they don't have the crew or the time, they can't. So they'll come, they'll come out to your place, but then they won't give you a bid for three or four weeks. You know that tells you what you need to know right there. They don't have the time to do it, you know. And so I had good contractors that were, you know, I worked with for years that are charging me retail prices, or I could just tell they didn't need the work. And so that told me, you know, hey, this is time for me to kind of back up, lobby. And I was already into multifamily, so it wasn't very hard for me to to pull the plug on the single family when I realized, that, you know, that the writing on the wall it wasn't the time anymore. Right. So we know on average, on average, how long it takes to get paid in the world of single family. Now, let me comment on that before I ask you the question. So just so the audience can follow along, when I say get paid, I'm talking cash flow. Yes. So in my world of private money, I always, in in the world of single family, I always, 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 100% of the time, borrow more money than I need to fund the deal because I'm using private money and I'm not using hard money. So when I buy it, like, you know, today I went to the attorney's office and I picked up an $80,000 check and I took no money to the table and I put no money in it myself out of my pocket. So that's cash flow. But with that being said, in, in your world, Jim, how long does it take to get paid in when you're playing in this kind of sandbox? <clears throat> Well, like, like anything, it's dependent on the deal, right? But a lot of times what we're doing, because these, these, these deals do take a while to get paid. So that's a great question, Jay. Obviously, you know that sometimes on these, it might be a year and a half till you get paid you know, something. So what we do or what we try to do on every deal is up front into the deal. We, we borrow more because we're going to be rehabbing these things. We're, buy, we're buying value-add assets, stuff that need to be, you know, they're under-managed or under-maintained, you know, or, or both. And uh, But we're putting an acquisition fee on the front end in many cases where we can pull out something, you know, whether it be a hundred grand, and not that it's huge, but it's something to get right out of the gate. We get a little, little spending money in our pocket. So that way that we can, you know, get the deal going. But a lot of times, you know, before, because the, the, the goal is we're keeping these things long-term. That's the plan here is to keep all these things long-term. So what, once we do the, the we, we take out the, the initial loan that we're going to rehab it with, you know, we're then, so we'll restabilize it, put a management company in place, hire on-site management, whatever the case calls for, for that particular asset. And then what we do is, in the end, we pull out a, a, what's called a non-recourse loan, and they'll give us eighty percent of the of the off of an eight percent cap on what the cash flow is. Just that, just the cash flow alone. So you can you can, so let's just say I got one going now. It's one hundred and five units. You know, we bought it for two point two. We're going to put about a million three into it. So we'll be into it for three point five. At eighty percent of eight percent eight cap of what it brings in, it'll be worth about five and a half close to six million. So we'll actually be able to pull out about a little over a million dollars free and clear because it's not even, it's not taxable because it's not income. It's just part of your equity that you created. You're pulling out early. Now, when you sell that asset, that's a different story, but we're not selling it. We're just refining it and pulling out some cash right now. So there's a couple of different spots in the deal we to grab money. Plus, then after that's done, we get the cash flow forever because uh, my, my plan is to keep these things. Now, I mean, if a fund comes in there, because there's a lot of funds that are offering way over what these values are because they want stabilized assets. If a fund comes in and wants to offer us over value, we're probably going to sell it. But that's not the plan. The plan is to hold everything as long as we possibly can. Gotcha. So what are some of the favorite ways, strategies to find these good deals? How do you find these deals? You know, networking. That's part of why I'm here. You know, that, that, that's, I'm looking for deals. I, that, that's why I'm doing interviews is because I'm looking for deals on these podcasts, you know, and because it, they are, they're not easy to find and networking. And, but we do all kinds of stuff. We look for, you know, long length of ownership of, of multifamily people that have owned them for a long time. People that have no mortgages, you know, we just from drive by stuff that we see like, wow, that thing looks really beat up. And we just look at, you know, all the, we send letters, we literally send gift baskets, say just introducing ourselves mm-hmm. as other multifamily owners in the area, wanting to network with, you know, if you, you own multifamily too, so do I, let's just talk, let's be friends. Uh, we're not asking him for a sale in any way, but that's, that's what I'm doing. I mean, I'm, I'm just planting the seed early that I, you know, that, hey, let's just be friends and network and it, you know, let them know in that letter that I also buy these things all, all, all the time. If they know anybody, one of their friends that's selling one of their, you know, a multifamily asset, let me know. I, I'd love to, you know, pay them a, a finder's fee. And, and they made a, I want to sell mine, but I didn't ask to sell buy theirs. I asked to buy somebody else's. So we're still friends. 
I got you. Well, now in a few minutes, as we promised at the beginning of the show, we're going to be giving out your contact information. And yep. you said earlier, if somebody's got a deal they want to submit to you, email it to you. So I don't want you to be bombarded with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails unless my audience is giving you at least part or a good part of the information that you're looking for. So if someone's got a deal that they're looking to partner with you on or to take a look at the structuring or to sell or to refer to you for a finder's fee, what kind of, what, what kind of overview kind of information about the deal would you be looking for to just begin to analyze the deal? The basics, yeah. The the the, the, the needle was bringing in monthly the current occupancy rate. If there's any capex needed, you know. If there's any repairs that are needed, that are known now, how much that is. If there's you know if there's an estimate of that, but really just a, the all I need to know is how many units there are, what the average rent is currently, and what the average rent is for the market if it's under market rent. Because many times these you know distressed assets are, are significantly under market rent. So as much information as you can give me about that, I'm going to run my own analysis no matter what. But what I can't get from an analysis is the financials, how much is bringing in, any kind of the, the bills it has monthly, it's, ex, it's monthly expenses. So that's the kind of stuff that I can't research on my own for the unit. So any kind of expenses that it has and what it's currently bringing in, current um, occupancy rate, that you know how many units are there, and the unit count, how many two bedrooms, how many three bedrooms, how many one bedrooms. And if you can have the square footage count of each of those, because you know even if there's two bedrooms, sometimes there's a two bedroom, one bath and a two bedroom, two bath. And the two bedroom, two bath is 150 square feet bigger. And so, you know, as much detail as you can get about the units, but really at the end, if you just have the expenses and the unit count, I can do the rest, you know? And so, uh, but yeah, what, I'm going to give you my email, which is my personal email, just email me with real deals. I, I you know, the people are, you know, are, are always emailing, Hey, I think I heard you. And I get enough emails that I, that I, I, I'm sure I'm like, like everybody, you, you, you lose emails all the time or you don't even get them. You don't even know about it. We all, it happens to all of us today. I mean, I, I heard some ridiculous statistic that Google that we get like, that the average person gets like 200 emails a day or something. Hey, I, I just I just read two days ago, the average, average person, I mean, working in a company, I'm not talking about the owner of a company or, you know, some high level management or whatever. Average person gets 170 emails a day. You said it was 200. It's, yeah, about the it's ridiculous. So, so, hey, for just a moment, for yeah. just a moment, Jim, let's go off subject and talk about a subject that everybody that's listening to the show or watching the show today wants to hear your answer to this. Yeah. I'm talking, I'm talking emails. I'm talking emails. And then in just a moment, we'll give out your contact information yeah. and people that have got a deal or want to refer your deal or they got a deal. They want to yeah, we'll pay finders fees. If you want to stay in the deal, whatever I'll pay finders yeah. fees, referral fee, whatever you want, whatever. If you're an agent referral fee, if not a, a marketing fee, we'll get you paid. Or if you don't want to stay in the deal, no problem. All right. So we'll give out your contact information on that in just a moment. But in the meantime, let's talk about management of emails. So, you know, before we started the show, you and I were talking about this offline. You know, I was telling you how much time I personally spent yesterday, last night, early this morning, just staying on top of my own personal emails in my lens. You know, I've got an army of virtual assistants, you know, helping me take care of my buying and selling house business. And I got the acquisitionist and I've got et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I'm still a little bit crazy myself while I'm staying on top of emails. Here's what I want to know from you. And you teased me a little bit <laughs> before the show even started. How do you manage your emails and stay on top of it? You mentioned to me, you started using a system, I don't know, a couple of years ago or whatever, that's really worked out well for well, you and you've used other systems. So what do you do? Okay. So, so I will, Sane Mail, S-A-N-E-M-A-I-L, Sane Mail is a system. I think it costs me 15 bucks a month. It literally goes through your email inbox initially and shows which emails you never open and puts them into the Sane mailbox. It, it divides it all down for you. So it's, it's incredible. It, initially, it just, it takes all the work out of, out of like, I have a, a Gmail or G Suite account. It took everything that I'd never opened or didn't want to put it into one. Email. I still got them. It just went into the same folder. So it keeps your sane, like, so you don't go insane. It's really a great name. And so, and then any, any email that comes into your inbox or any email that comes into your inbox that has never emailed you before automatically goes into the same box. So you have to check that. And then if there's somebody you want to get an email from, you just drag it out and put it in your inbox. It's super easy. However, 
I leave every day now with my inbox zeroed out. Not one email in my, every single day. Hush. I cannot. I went to a mastermind with a business partner of mine, Lee Carney. He's a, he's a big dog out of Florida that does, does a lot of deals. Right? But one of the biggest things I learned from him, and I've learned a lot from Lee, a lot. But the, the thing that's kept me the most sane is, is how to clear out my inbox every single day. And so you always get those emails, those reminders, right? And so you got to start a task list. First of all, have a, have a t- just a simple, like I use Google Docs, critical to do. So that way I put the email and now in Gmail, do you have you, if you use Gmail or G Suite, you can literally drag an email over. It is incredible what they just came up with. So that's brand new. But prior to all of that, just having a to be read. So any email, it's a, you know, we call it, you know, a lengthy email. It's like, oh, I just put it in a to be read folder. I'm going to get to it, you know, but, but all the short ones, the quick responses, and I don't send a response that's over five emails anymore, ever, because it's not needed. If it, if it needs more than that, let's get on the phone and figure it out, right? Because those emails, I don't type, it takes me forever to type those emails out. It could be a five minute phone call. It takes me an hour to send the email. Why would I do that? You know? So if I'm over five lines, I'm like, I'll just say, I'll scrape, scrape the whole thing. What time can you talk tomorrow? Give me five minutes and we'll figure it out. So, you know, just taking those long emails that I do need to respond to, I put them in a to be read folder. I have a folder right there under my inbox to be read. It's called, it's at to be read. So it stays at the top. And so that, that helps me get rid of everything right away. And then it also, because my goal is to have it zeroed out every day, I respond quicker in shorter answers. You know, just, they don't, it's an email. It doesn't need to be, you don't need, you know, you're not, you don't need to be, you know, trying to make new friends. You're not trying to get married. Just send your response quick. It can be curt. It doesn't matter. You know, that's the way texting is. That's the way the world's become. And we all get so many emails. Who has time for all of that? Right? So it's, it's, it is the, the same mail is what started it. That's what got me okay. But I still had like a hundred in my, my, my comfort zone when I first started using same mail was 99. If I was at 99, I could go home and sleep. 101, I was like, oh my God, this is terrible. And now I'm zeroed out every day. I will not leave before it's zeroed out every single day. Turning my phone on and seeing you have zero is the best feeling I can see. <laughs> and every day now. And so it's it all it's same mail. And then having that to be read later for the long ones. And then a, a task list. Just I keep it on my, my folder. It opens up when I open my, my desktop. All this is a Google Doc. It says critical to do. Because those emails you're keeping as reminders are clogging it up and it's screwing you all up because you're going back in there for reminders. Just get it in a task, whatever it is. Call Joe, call Jay, call whoever, and then put you, you could sort that, that email. You could always find it because you could search your inbox so, or find a folder to put it in. Do you remember where it is? Either way, you just put it on a task and get it off your inbox because otherwise it just clogs up. And then, then you don't know where to start and where to finish because you got all these new ones. You're like, crap, I haven't gotten to these ones down here. And you get overwhelmed and then you're up till 1245 in the morning like you were last day. <laughs> I hear you, man. So, you know, one thing that's so frustrating is when you try to unsubscribe from a email sender and then they've got like this, you know, juju juice that, you know, they like secretly have you on five different lists and they keep emailing you. Anyway, does same mail help you really unsubscribe from people? No, but you know what does? What? Spam filter at the top of your email box. I don't even unsubscribe anymore. I just spam them all. Spam, spam. And then you don't get anything from them ever. It goes into your junk that you never, ever see. So, just okay. I got you. So, so if you click and denote a sender as spam, then it keeps going in your spam yeah, going forward. Junked. I've accidentally spammed people that I want emails from. And I'm like, crap. They, said they sent me an email. like, crap. So then I go look and they're in my junk. And I spammed them, you know? And so <laughs> I don't have time. for. I get too many emails. I lose emails all the time. I don't have enough for emails that I unsubscribe for. So I don't even unsubscribe. I used to have a folder, by the way. I had an unsubscribe folder that every week I would put my stuff in there and my assistant on Fridays would go in there and unsubscribe. But then I would I'd be putting it, wait, I put this in here two weeks ago. What the, is she not doing her job? You know? And so she, she said she did. I realized the same thing that we just, you're just getting another email from them. You know, like they don't take you off the list. So I just, I spam them. If, if I unsubscribe and I see it again, spam. So I do keep a track of that because I don't want to spam somebody who's not, shouldn't be spammed. Right. If I subscribe to it, I'm not going to spam them. But if I unsubscribe and I keep getting stuff, they're spammed and I never see it again. There you go. There you go. Well, my name, well, look, thank you for going on a detour there with me for a moment because <laughs> happy to do it, Jay. Happy I mean, you know, it, the email management thing is like almost everybody has to deal with. So if, I, I if, you don't, I, if you don't call me and tell me how you do it, because I mean, it is, I did, I do have it figured out though. Like what I told you is what I do. I have a, a, a critical to-do list that that goes on. Then the email goes into the, you know, it goes out of my inbox, the long emails that I just, going to read, but maybe tomorrow I put in the to be read folder at to be read. So it stays at the top in my folder file. So I put the at sign and my folder is clear every single day. Like right be- before this, I had three in there, three. 
That's all. Awesome. I'll, I'll complete before the day and it'll be zeroed out. Beautiful. As we've been promising everybody, your contact information. So how can people continue the conversation with you? All right. Well, you can email me any, any deal information. Email me. My email is my name. It's Jim at Jim It's J I M at J I M H U N T Z I C K E R.com. And if you have a real deal right now that you're like, Oh my God, this is what I've been waiting for. Call me right now. 847-772-5302. I'll repeat it. It's 847-772-5302. That's awesome, Jim. Jim, thank you so much for taking the time to be here on the show. I know that you're going to have uh, some of my audience members connecting with you and doing deals with you. And so this is fantastic, man. And I also look forward to seeing you not too far down the road at our next mastermind meeting. For sure. Looking forward to it, Jay. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. All right. God bless you, Jim. And to all of y'all joining here on the show, thank you for tuning in. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. Wishing you all the best. And here's to taking your real estate investing business to the next level. Bye for now.